Well, it's a beautiful Sunday morning, so welcome to, to all. Tough season, but not without hope. This morning we're going to open that hope wide open and worship the God of all hope. And my prayer is the same as Paul here in Romans, that the God of hope would fill you with joy and peace and believing this gospel. So I desire to be a minister for your joy this morning. So let us go to our God in prayer and we will open up Romans chapter 3. Father, we come before you and we are filled with joy as we gaze upon the Lord Jesus Christ and all that He is, and all that He has done, and all that He will do. For He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's worthy to be worshipped. He's worthy to be served. God, I pray that all of our hearts this morning would be full, that You'd push away all the distractions and all the things going on around us. And we would just stare into that glory this morning and our hearts would be lifted. God, I thank you for such a glorious gospel, and I pray by your Spirit now that you would illuminate it to every mind and heart that will hear my voice. God, I pray now that my thoughts wouldn't come into this. This would be your thoughts, your word, and your word alone. That's going to reveal your glory in such a beautiful way this morning. I ask that you would put yourself on display. And let us marvel. God, I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 3. This morning we're going to finish up our glance into the innermost meaning of the cross. Paul's brought us right into Calvary's hill to glimpse into God's purpose for the death of his son on a tree. The sight has been beautiful and awful and glorious all rolled into one. Behold the kindness and the severity of of God. We've been working through these verses that are before us with this following outline. We're looking at eight elements of the righteousness that God imparts to a believer. First point, it's a righteousness that's now revealed. Secondly, it's a righteousness that comes to us by faith. Thirdly, it's a righteousness for all. For every tribe, tongue, nation, and race, this gospel is fitting because we're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. And fourthly, it's a righteousness that makes us acceptable to God. Being justified. There's a way to be not guilty before God and forgiven and stand in His presence, blameless with great joy. How is that possible through the means or connection in our our redemption? A kinsman redeemer who came and died for us and bought us out of the marketplace. He purchased us from sin and death and the devil's dominion. And he came and he purchased us back to God. And he had to pay a price called propitiation. He had to go up on a cross and he had to absorb the wrath of God for all of our sin and drain every last drop so that now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he did it in his blood. And his blood represents death, a sacrificial death. And I want to begin this morning with quoting from one of the great saints of old named Horatius Bonar. I almost named a child after him. I love that name, Horatius. Laura didn't like it. She didn't like any of my names. Whitfield, Spurgeon, all of them. She just didn't like them. So we've got names like Jordan and Taylor and Josh. So... Boring. It is not by incarnation, but by blood shedding that we're saved. The Christ of God is no mere expounder of wisdom, no mere deliverer or gracious benefactor. And they who think that they have told the whole gospel when they spoke, spoken of Jesus revealing the love of God, they greatly err. If Christ is not the substitute, which is all that we've been studying, he's nothing to the sinner. If he did not die as the sin bearer, he has died in vain. Let us not be deceived on this point, nor misled by those who, when they announce Christ as the deliverer, think that they preach the gospel. If I throw a rope to a drowning man, I'm a deliverer. But is Christ no more than that? If I cast myself into the sea and risk myself to save another, I am a deliverer. 
But is Christ no more? Did he but risk his life? The very essence of Christ's deliverance is the substitution of himself for us, his life for ours. He did not come to risk his life, he came to die. He did not redeem us by a little loss or a little sacrifice or a little labor or a little suffering. He redeemed us to God by his blood, the precious blood of Christ in 1 Peter 1.18. He gave all he had, even his life for us. This is the kind of deliverance that awakens the happy song in Revelation 1.5 to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And so by his blood, the propitiation, he was killed on a cross on our behalf. So last Sunday, I introduced verse 25 as the linchpin of this section. Verses 21 through 24, we studied that God is a justifier. We saw the love of God, the grace of God that he could justify us and make us right with him. So we have a God who's a justifying God to sinful men, women, and children. And then on the other half, 25b through 26, Paul is showing us that he's also a just God. So he's a justifier, and he's a just God that he he has to punish sin. This is the crux of the whole Bible, the whole gospel. How can God be right in declaring sinners righteous? Last week I quoted Proverbs 17, 15. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. It's an abomination to say righteous to those who are wicked. Is that not the gospel? How can God be right then in justifying wicked people like us? Three chapters in Romans to show you that you're guilty. And now God declares you not guilty. Forgiving sinners and declaring them to be righteous You have full access to God. It's the most loving thing that I've ever heard of. But is it just? Is it right? And so we took up last week, we looked at the cross and we saw propitiation. And now the application will be made this morning that's just beautiful. Paul's going to work that out. What could be the most important question that could ever be asked or ever understood? We're going to look at that answer. Does God's glory matter to God? Does it matter to him that he is seen as righteous and all of his acts are righteous? Does that matter to God? I mean, he's God. Can't he just do as he pleases? If he wants to forgive sinners, can't he just forgive them? He's God. If he decides he doesn't want to punish sin, then just let him be God and do that. And Paul says, no way. It matters to God. And so this morning, Paul's going to take on some antagonists who look at the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is just filled with sin after sin after sin. And it's, much of it is by God's people, Israel. Many of the heroes of our faith that we're going to look at in chapter 4, David and Abraham. <coughs> is God really righteous? Is he really just to just let all of that go? And that's what Paul's going to answer for us this morning. And it's breathtaking in his answer. And so I got good news for you. We're moving to our fifth point in our outline. I want to look at the fifth element of the righteousness then that God imparts to the believer. And this point, it's a righteousness that vindicates the righteousness of God. It vindicates his righteousness for the question that's before us. What was the purpose of such an act of the cross that was full of such love and such justice? If you look with me then in verse 25. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. The cross of Christ was to demonstrate God's righteousness. So what does that mean? And we've got to make this kind of a contextual distinction as we begin this morning. In verse 21, a righteousness is revealed. And it's a, a God kind of righteousness that he gives to us to make us acceptable to him. But here now in verse 25 and 26, 
This is God declaring his own righteousness. It's not the righteousness that he gives to us in salvation, but it's his very character that he is righteous. That's what we're looking at. So is he righteous to declare us righteous is the question. This is dealing with God's equity, his judicial righteousness, his his glory, his name, his honor. And so the question is, The scriptures are so clear from cover to cover that God is just. It's his character. It's his attribute. He can't be anything but just. He can't violate who he is. This is bedrock of Christianity that our God is just. So why would God have to demonstrate his righteousness to mankind? God wants to demonstrate to the world that all his forgiveness and his justification of sinners, that he is just when he does that. God never violates himself when he saves a sinner. The wisdom of God was to give a salvation to sinners that took every one of his attributes and it put them on display in all of their fullness. When I teach the attributes of God, the application of every attribute is where do you see this attribute the clearest? Well, come with me to the cross of Jesus Christ. And on that cross, we just see the attributes of God climaxing and reaching their peak, their fullest. So let's take a look then at Paul's answer as to why God was demonstrating his righteousness to the world. And the answer in verse 25 is because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed. Passed over, this word is used only here in the New Testament. And it was a word that was used in Roman law. If you made a will and you left someone out, it meant to pass over a relative. It literally meant to to overlook intentionally. The King James translates it as remission. And that's a wrong translation. It means to remit or forgiveness. That's not the idea here at all. The word is pretermission. And pretermission means neglecting to enforce a penalty. <clears throat> it's overlooking something. It's passing over. So it, it didn't bring a penalty at the time that the sin was committed. And so I want you to feel what's going on here. I want you to sense the weight of what we're talking about. Because the righteousness of God is in jeopardy here. That's what Paul's dealing with. The very character of God is at stake. And verse 26 says, he can be just. And so he's defending that this free salvation is just for sinners. If sin is not dealt with, and there is forgiveness, God is not just. It is not right. If if he just passed over sins previously committed, There's something wrong with the justice of God. There's a defect. And so this is the vindication of the righteousness of God. And it was done in verse 25 through the death of his son last week that I will now flesh out. But let's look first at passed over sins previously committed. What does that mean? In Psalm 103.10, David said this, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. He passed over our iniquities. He's not dished out the punishment that they deserve. Verse 26 of Romans 3 says, at the present time. So Paul's referring to the past as he's writing this. And so this would be all the sins since the fall in the garden to present. Adam, the day you eat of the tree, you'll surely die. In the Old Testament, you have Abraham. And he lies to the king that that his wife is my sister. Moses murders an Egyptian. Jacob's a liar and a cheat. David commits royal rape and murder. I want you to listen to 2 Samuel 12, 9 with Nathan David, why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you've taken his wife to be your wife, 
and you've killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. And then David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has taken away your sin. You shall not die. I think it was John Piper. I heard him 20 years ago talk about, for example, he said, what if you were the father of Bathsheba? Your daughter has been raped by the king and your son-in-law has now been killed by battle. And the Lord has forgiven David. Your sins just passed over, David. Do you see how the justice of God is at stake here? By God showing mercy? Passing over sins previously committed? Is that right? Just, David, your sins are forgiven. They're gone. I'm telling you, the very glory of God is at stake in this question. How can God be just and justify the ungodly? David, your sins are forgiven. I'm a just God. How, how does this work? This was Charles Spurgeon's dilemma when God was drawing him, and I want to read you the inner heart of Charles Spurgeon. He said, When I was under the hand of the Holy Spirit, under the conviction of sin, I had a clear and sharp sense of the justice of God. Sin, whatever it might be to other people, became to me an intolerable burden. And it was not so much that I feared hell, but that I feared sin. I knew myself to be so horribly guilty that I remember feeling that if God did not punish me for sin, he ought to do so. And I felt that the judge of all the earth ought to condemn such sin as mine. And I had upon my mind a deep concern, hear this, for the honor of God's name and the integrity of his moral government. I felt that it would not satisfy my conscience if I could be forgiven unjustly. The sin I had committed must be punished. But then there was the question, how could God be just and yet justify me who had been so guilty? I was worried and wearied with this question, and neither could I see any answer to it. Certainly, I could have never invented an answer which could have ever satisfied my conscience. And that is the very issue that Paul is dealing with here this morning. How do you satisfy this problem? And so the character of God is at stake if this cannot be answered. And this is so big, so I want to make sure that we don't miss it. So I want to park here for one second. First, I want to ask you, if you'll flip over to Romans chapter 11. <coughs> Where is all this moving? All that we're studying and looking at in Romans of this glorious gospel, where, where is Paul going to take it? And we just keep climbing Mount Everest and looking more at the beauty of what God has done in Christ. And when you get to the very top, the very peak of the mountain, I want you to hear where Paul's taking this. Verse 33. Oh, the depth of oh, the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. That's what we're looking at this morning. The wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. Who can get this? For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become His counselor? Quit counseling God and telling Him how to do things. Or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again, which breaks grace? Bottom line. For from God, from Him, and through Him, and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. All of this is leading us to Mount Everest to just marvel at the glory of God and what He has done in Jesus Christ. This is where we must end up as we climb this gospel together. Here's the view from the top. And so what is before us right now is big. What is the chief end of man but to enjoy God and glorify Him forever? And the chief end of God is to put Himself on display. That His glory would be shown and worshipped and marveled and adored for all of eternity. 
God so loves his glory because it's the best and the, the infinite, most beautiful thing and splendor and glory that he has to put that on display or it won't be the best for all of us. And so God's glory is what everything is pointing and moving toward and what this is about. God's passion for his glory is unmistakable. And so we have a big problem that needs to be solved here this morning in this passage. If you'll remember when I was preaching through it, I skipped verse 23 in our study and I said, I reserve the right to come back to it and now is the right. So come back with me to verse 23 of Romans 3. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God passed over former sins. What were they? Well, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Greek word means to lack. All lack the glory of God. All of mankind, without distinction, lack the glory of God. What does that mean? In Romans 1.23, we studied it. In, the, in, in suppressing God and creation, you exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of a corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. The, the glory of God and all that he is, you exchange it for something less, something created, something in the image of God instead of God. There's the sin of all of humanity is there's something so beautiful and glorious called God and our whole being has been made for him to worship him and adore him and sin is that we exchange that for something lesser. And so all have sinned and exchanged that for something less. God's the most glorious thing in all of the universe. Nothing can be compared to him. Nothing. Who's a God like ours? Declaring the end from the beginning. Speaking a universe into being and he's glorious within and without. He made us in his image to enjoy him in the fullest. Adam and God walked in the garden and had fellowship and God was in the right place in Adam's heart. We were designed to see God's glory and delight in it and enjoy it for all of eternity and sin entered the world. Adam and Eve chose something over God's glory. They chose the fruit of a tree that they were commanded not to eat, and they plunged the whole human race with them. And now Romans has taught us that we're all born into sin under its dominion, and that dominion causes you to lack the glory of God and to love something other than Him supremely. That's the, the total reason this whole world is broken and falling apart. We exchange that for something lesser. And how that looks is the most glorious one. The unrivaled God is exchanged for idols. Other things are desired over him. I can't give you a worse picture of the state of humanity or the human heart is that it prefers anything over God. Is there anything that proves depravity anymore is that we, we want something more than God. What is wrong with us? That's the fall. I was at a wedding for my son, and we, uh, Adam Parker, bless his heart, was given a boat, and we went out on Lake Dillon. And you're sitting on that lake with the mountains that have snow cap on them, and you're just looking at the majesty of God and what he's done. And I just can't, you just can't look at that and say, you know, all, all I want to do is make money. All I want to do is get power. My, my fame is really special. I want my comfort. I want my way. You, you just, the foolishness of that as you're staring at this majesty just preaches sin. And that's the brokenness of our world that we're watching on a daily basis and everybody's trying to diagnose what the problem is. I'll tell you what the problem is. They lack the glory of God. And they want everything other than God at the center of their lives and their hearts. We were made for God and we were made to bask in and enjoy his glory. And we were made to find the fullness of joy in making that glory known. My joy is made full when I declare it and worship it. And we've despised God and we've spit in his face. And we've worshiped other things than him and gave him the back seat. All have done it and lacked the glory of God. 
And my question to you this morning, does God care? Does God care about this? He passed over sins previously committed. God said, David, I've withheld nothing from you. And if there was something that you wanted, just ask and I would have gave it to you. Nathan said, David, why have you despised God? And David says, I didn't despise God. I just wanted Bathsheba. No, you traded God for all of his glory and you committed adultery. You valued a woman who was not your wife over me. Against you and you only have I sinned, God. <clears throat> Does God care that the history of Israel just was forsaking him and chasing other lovers? That's the whole history. A history just filled with idolatry, lacking his glory through the whole Bible, cover to cover. They, they lack glory. They, they choose idols over God. That's our history. Does God care that I valued my own glory playing basketball, the approval of others at any cost, sensuality being more important than his presence. We all chose other things. Does he care what's going on in our city this very day? Does he care about people ripping up the unity of the church of God? Does he care about a world that values everything more than him? that his glory is trampled every day, and then he just passed over it? All that idolatry, he just passed over it? It must not be very valuable or important to God if he just passes over. Why should I care about his glory then if he doesn't? Such despising of God, does he care? Do you see that his righteousness is at stake if he doesn't value his glory? If he doesn't punish sin rightly for despising his glory, he's not righteous. He's not just. And so this is so big what's going on in this verse. All of history and God's plan and his glory are at stake. His very character and worth are on trial. And this morning, I want you to hear the most amazing answer ever to this dilemma and this concern. It's the cross of Christ. The public vindication of the righteousness of God. It's the loudest His righteousness has ever thundered at that cross. It's the clearest manifestation of God's justice that He's just. He's so just that he will punish every sin for despising his glory, even if it's upon his own son. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Even upon his own son, his sword had to be unsheathed. And so some 2,000 years ago, God vindicated his righteousness. I don't overlook sin. I don't ignore my glory being despised. <clears throat> Those sins were passed over because another would come and take the punishment for them. God did not violate his justice. He exalted it and he lifted it as high as it could possibly go. God dealt with sin fully, faithfully, and righteously on his own son on a cross. What we looked at last week, put him up on a cross he poured out his full wrath. Darkness comes over the whole land. And for three hours, Jesus is propitiating the full wrath of God for all of our sin. It's over. And there's just this dead, beaten, bloodied, bruised corpse called the Son of God, dead on a cross in a dark world. Finished. The innocent one dead the apple of God's eye without breath. Does God care about his glory? If God just passes over this and forgives us. God is joining sinners in their view of his glory. And that's unrighteous. 
God can't deal that way with sin and His glory. So what is the way that God can vindicate His glory? Well, He could send you to hell forever. Or His justice will be poured out on you for all of eternity and you'll never be able to satisfy it. And that will vindicate His righteousness, His holiness, and His justice. In our day and age, we want to take that away because it's too much. Because we don't realize that that the offense of despising the glory of God and what that means. And it's of such value that it, it will be punished for all of eternity. And that's a way to vindicate the justice of God. But there's another way to vindicate it. And it's to put His own Son up on a cross where He bears that full wrath so that you will never have to bear a drop of it. And His righteousness is vindicated on that cross and His justice is satisfied. And now He can forgive sinners like you and me. There's a way to save sinners. There's a way to justify them. For God's glory is not diminished, but it's exalted to the heavens. There's a way that His glory can be seen for what it's really worth. And so Christ came and on that cross He exalted that glory to the heavens. In John 12, he said, Jesus said, Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. There came therefore a voice out of heaven. I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. So God now can be just. And he can justify the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Who comes up with a plan like that? (laughs) That's the wisdom of God and it should take your breath away. And it should cause us to worship and to value that glory. Spurgeon said, God is able to forgive without shaking the basis of His throne. His glory is not belittled when He justifies the ungodly then, but it's exalted. He's a vindicated God And he's dealt with us absolutely just and perfectly to his character. There was not a winking at sin or a flinching. And so the way that God can be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus should take our hearts away. And I just wanted to close with a couple of songs that have been on my heart this week. And I'm just going to read you some of them. First one, here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood, shed for us his precious blood, who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing him praise, he can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide, Through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above. Heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. Here is love vast as the heavens, countless as the stars above. Are the souls that he has ransomed, precious daughters, treasured sons. We are called to feast forever on a love beyond our time. Glorious Father, Son, and Spirit, now with man are intertwined. And then I'd like to quote from how deep the Father's love for us. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away. As wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. 
Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. The gospel of Jesus Christ. As we close, I'm just, I want to bring a few thoughts that have been on my heart this week. Romans 3, 21 through 26. Church of God, I want you to unite with me for this gospel. To do all that we can with the days that God has given us. To lift high the cross of Christ. I don't want anyone on the bench if sick, you're praying for gospel and for revival, but every one of us are unified that this gospel is too good and glorious and beautiful to be the best kept secret and that we would all give our lives for the spread of such a message. Second, will you make this glory your chief end? We lack the glory of God and by this gospel, it puts that glory back as the centerpiece of our life and our hearts. And so will you let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. Don't make earthly comforts and freedoms your chief end. Come fight your flesh with me to make this glory everything, everything to us. Because it is to God. Thirdly, all have sinned and lacked the glory of God. That's the real problem of our world. And I want to engage this world in love and humility like Christ in truth with this remedy because we're a debtor to all men, every race, Republicans and Democrats, people who believe there's a real problem with COVID and people who don't. And I want us to be debtors and to enter in with this message to get people right again, to quit lacking His glory and to see this gospel to put God's glory as a centerpiece. And so I want us all to join hands. And as Paul began this epistle, I want us to be unashamed of this gospel because there's going to be a cost to proclaim it and to preach it. You're going to be thought idiots and fools. It's the power of God to bring people into the realm of salvation. And so I pray that all of us would be so overwhelmed with this gospel. It just comes out. And it's got to be shared. And we enter into lives and we bring this to people. And then I want us to stand firm in your freedom. Don't be subject again to a yoke of slavery. This gospel redeemed you out from under the law. Don't go back under works trying to get God's favor and acceptance Stay firm in this gospel that you're loved by God and accepted and justified and enter out into this world in that reality and that truth. Stand firm in your freedom. Don't go back under the law. Anyone sitting here this morning, back under the law, trying to get God's favor through your performance, stop. Stand firm in your freedom. This gospel's too glorious to walk away from it and go back to Moses. Stay in the glorious freedom of this gospel, the sons of God. Six, I'm going to steal some words from the Apostle Paul. For though I'm free from all men, I've made myself a slave to all, that I might win the more to Jesus Christ. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being under myself under the law. <clears throat> that I might win those who are under the law. And to those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, that I by all means might save some. And I do all things for the sake of the gospel that I might become a fellow partaker of it, koinonia in the gospel. Do you know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you might win. 
and everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Because of that inheritance, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I buffet my body and I make it my slave, lest possibly after I preach to others, I myself should not be disqualified. I pray that we would run with aim and enter into this world and meet people where they're at and bring this gospel to save all. Love and compassion with truth. Seven. Parents. What a high calling to raise children in a day like this. So teach your children. Teach your children by word and by deed and by ministry. Show them a life that is taking up with God's glory to go love Him and love others. Teach them this gospel. I'm telling you, I had a two-year-old who could understand propitiation. Take these words in Romans and go sow them in their minds and their hearts that they understand them, dads and moms. Teach them these truths. Show them a gospel that's glorious and beautiful and show them a life that is abandoned to it, that your life is taken up with the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's parenting. You so love this gospel and live it. Sow it into them. Show them. Show them this is the best life ever to lose your life for Jesus Christ. The joy and the peace and the glory that comes with it. Show them some sacrifice for the gospel. Instead of just being lazy, show them lives that you're going to lose for something of such value. One day they're, they're going to they're take up your mantra of just being apathetic and lazy and your hearts are going to be broken and you're going to say, why don't they care? But I'm telling you, this is parenting. That Romans 3, 21 through 31 has your heart and it's what you love, speak, proclaim, share. Don't be hypocrites. This gospel is too glorious. Play games and make it secondary. Marriages. This is what you're to put on display. What we have been looking at is a love like no other. And you want to go show the way Christ loves the bride, husbands, and gives himself for her and washes her and cleanses her in the word of God. Let this gospel permeate you, husbands and wives, into saying we want to go show the world Christ and his bride. I want people coming up to you saying, that's the gospel. I see it by your marriage. And I want you to let this gospel be bigger than the toilet seat up or down or who burnt the toast. I don't care. Let those lesser things go. And let this be everything and come together as a couple and join hands to advance the name of Jesus Christ and this gospel. You, you want to have unity in a marriage, it's got to be that. That's, I, I, I didn't get married to have a good marriage. <laughs> I got married to show that to the world. Make that your chief end, and I've never seen a marriage not blossom when two people will make that their goal. Young disciples and all singles, you have a gift to be single-minded for this cause of Jesus Christ. And you can spend all your days, I wish I was married, and all, all you do is groan, grumble, complain, discontent. And there's a gospel to be preached and shared and proclaimed. And I care about loneliness and I care about it. I, 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 if you have that desire, I pray that God meets it. But until he does, you have the ability to be single-minded and single-hearted and single-focused to lose your life for the spread of this gospel. Redeem it. Redeem it. It's a gift. Don't waste it and lament and self-pity. Let this gospel take up your heart and be single-minded and single-devoted. And, 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 mar and marrieds and families love the singles and get them in your home and care about them and help them. But singles, lose your life for this gospel. I step on your toes because I love you. And I want you to be blessed of God. 
Tenth, if you're keeping track. Any sacrifice for this gospel, you'll receive tenfold more. So I call you, give up your time, your money, and your homes, your hospitality. Any sacrifice for this gospel. This gospel demands my life, my soul, my all. And American Christianity has no sacrifice in it. And what we just looked at this morning demands sacrifice. And I want you to sacrifice for this gospel. Number 11. I got 30. Is there cloud cover still here? We need each other. We're living in the end days. Maybe the end of the end days. And Jesus said in those days, most people's love will grow cold. And I've been watching love grow cold all around this country, all around me, in my own heart at times. We need to lock shields and we need to not lose what we just looked at as the preeminent thing of our lives and our hearts and our hope. Guys, this isn't our hope. Our hope is eternal life. Our hope is to be with God. Don't Here we have no lasting city. Quit trying to make this your, your home. Passing through, we're aliens, we're sojourners. Let's help each other think that way and not put our tent stakes down and see how comfortable we can make this journey here on earth. Let's help each other fight for that because all of our flesh wants that. And so we got to lock in and help each other and not let our love grow cold. Fight it. Fight for it. This isn't the time to be cold and apathetic. A bridegroom might be coming back today. I want to be one of the virgins who's alert and ready and waiting for Jesus Christ. And then number 12, love your brethren for whom Christ died. Romans 14, we've gone over this many times. Don't judge them and don't look down on them. We've got a lot of different thoughts on the things that are going on around us. And they're, they're just lesser. <laughs> what, what Christ cares about is how we love each other and receive each other with our differences. It's not who's right. He never even says who's right in Romans 14. <laughs> it's not right or wrong, strong or weaker. I just want you to not lose sight of what really matters. And what really matters is the Son of God propitiating the sins, <laughs> the wrath of God for our sins on a cross. And so I pray, be loving with each other and nurture each other and care about differences. Don't, don't say this group is afraid, this group is uh, liberal. Just let's love each other with a different thought, but one, one hope, one faith, and one Lord, one baptism, one hope. Stay unified. Stay unified because the one thing that God doesn't want is disunity. And in the very thing that you're, you're, you're holding to, you might, even, you might be right, but how you're handling it is wrong. And so don't lose sight of the bigger picture. And so let's, let's lock shields. We need each other more than ever to make it to the end. And so I just encourage you more than ever that there are going to be some hard days. And I, we're not done with this by any means. I, I still think a lot more is coming. Locking up, shutting down. There's just a whole bunch of things and we got to pray and seek God. And so the one thing... I can tell you about the elder board is we're, we're getting in prayer, reading the word, checking with other godly men that we know of, and we're doing everything we can to shepherd this flock. And so the only thing I'm afraid of is not obeying God. And I want to obey what his word says. And so just know we're going to all labor together and, and nobody's checking out and flinching and, and afraid. And we're just, we're just all together as one now and let's work together with a whole lot of confusion and differences. It's hard in a country when you can hardly get the truth. And so no one's got it perfect. If you think you got it figured out, you're, you're probably prideful. So let's be humble with each other and, and take care of each other and help each other so that where the world's falling apart around us, we're unified in this gospel and they're going to look and say, what's different? But if we just start acting like them and we're afraid of everything that's going on and and, and just making our chief end, our liberties, and all these different things, you're, you're not going to show forth the gospel. And so we have an opportunity, what I just preached, to show the glory of it and the beauty of it in a world where that unifies us 
and, and we're one on that thing. So that's, that's my last application. You guys got any? Stand up and preach it. Robin, you got something for me, brother? I've missed you. Okay. Ray, you got something for me? Come on. Anybody else got application? It's a beautiful day out. I don't want to end the service. All righty, I will. Let's pray. Man, I love this gospel. God's just. I'm the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. Father, thank you. Your attributes are so glorious and beautiful. Who you are, we just praise you and worship you. I thank you for being a God like this. I thank you that you're just and a justifier. You're full of grace and love and truth and full of justice. God, it's beautiful and glorious, your wisdom to come up with a plan like this. And Lord, your righteousness is not questioned because of the cross of Jesus Christ. You answered it with a final exclamation point. There's no doubt, no question. We just worship you for this answer. And I pray that every heart is taken up in a gospel like this. Lord, we give you all the glory, praise, and honor for this day. Amen.